Hello, good afternoon. Uh, we were practicing on a dance for, for hours, but then Gidi didn't want to do it. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Ron Tellem. I'm VP of Programming for Keshet, and also very, very fortunate to be an executive producer on Homeland. Uh, sitting here, circling around, are two very talented men. Uh, the first one is Gideon Raff. He wrote down his idea for a new drama series uh, for the Israeli television in 2009. It, it all started at a meeting in, in a small cafe in LA uh, where Gidi sat with Keshet CEO, Avinir. He told him the story about uh, prisoners of war and the same day they decided to go for it. A scripts were written, the Israeli production started. And a few months later, Avinir met with Rick Rosen of WME, showed him the script in English. Uh, Rick immediately thought he knew the guys that should do that show. Uh, the scripts were given to Alex Ganza and Howard Gordon. And fortunately enough, they came into the very, very good hands of Fox 21st, which we have the president here, uh, Bert. And a few months later, an American TV series called Homeland started its production, and the rest is history. Seven months ago, on, on a very hot day in LA, um, Homeland won the Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series, so I would like to welcome our two special guests, Gideon Ralph and Bert Salkin. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank you all who are sitting here and have found the time to skip another important mit meeting, uh, which might lead you to missing the next big format, because somebody else is buying it right now, so my apologies in advance. Um, I would like to start our session and take you back to April last year, and this is a true story. Um, on the 9th of April the 8th, 2012, an anonymous woman arrived at an LA police station. She claimed that she was attacked in a club that night. She was brutally beaten by another woman she clearly recognized as Lindsay Lohan. True story. Police were not so surprised as, as it being Lindsay Lohan, so they drove off to, to Lindsay's house and said, Lindsay, somebody said you attacked her two hours ago, and Lindsay said, that's impossible because I was sitting home watching Homeland. <laughs> so this story can lead into two different conclusions. One of them, Lindsay is, is lying very, very beautifully. The next thing is that Homeland, aside from being a very good drama, is a must-see drama. Um, I think a definition of a must-see drama is a drama that becomes so thrilling that you cannot miss the next episode. Um, Bert, Giddy, do you see Homeland as, as a must-see drama? Is that something that you thought about when you first started working on the project? Go ahead, Giddy. Well, uh, you know, uh, what we always talk about with Homeland is the sort of global quality of it, meaning that it started in Israel in the mind of Gideon Raff in Hatufim and Prisoner of War, and then was, was uh, adapted and translated by Howard Gordon and Alex Ganza with help from Gideon um, for the American audience. And I think that, you know, look, what we're looking for uh, is uh, storytellers with a vision. So I don't think you start by saying we're going to create something that's big and that's huge and it's going to be big in the world, it's going to win Golden Globes and Emmys. You start with a good story, which is what Gideon does and Howard Gordon and Alex Gonza do. And, you know, that's how it began, but it was a good story. It was compelling. And I think that, that you know, Showtime originally understood what it was right away. And frankly, America and then worldwide audiences did. So, you know, I, I don't know if it's the same thing or different. Does a great story mean that it's must see? You know, sometimes if you're lucky, but it has to all come together. But really, it starts in that germ of what the idea is. Giddy, your thought? I completely uh, Can you hear me? <laughs> I completely agree with Bert. Um, I think it's, as a creator, it's too intimidating to think about the result or how the audience will receive it when you start writing it. Um, and it's too far away also. You, you, you drown in the world of the, the characters and, and the story and, and um, you hope that you're telling a story that's genuine to these characters and, and you try to avoid thinking about the result as much as possible. Um, 
And definitely what Homeland achieved is something that nobody expected. Um, it went way beyond our expectations. So um, in approaching a second season after such a successful first, and in approaching a third season, and now in approaching a new show, you can't think about these things. It's, it's paralyzing. You have to just focus on the creation. So I will try to ignore your answers and suggest that there is a method in, in, in making a drama a must-see drama. I think uh, if, if we try to analyze Homeland and, and Khatufim for that instance, you, you could analyze almost three lines uh, that I think make it a different drama than any other drama there is. Um, I think uh, if you allow me, I'll go with, with, the third, with the first line. And the first line would be dealing with, with what we call the zeitgeist material. Um, just in order to know what we're dealing with, uh, let's, let's see the first clip that we have that shows a scene from Khatufim and then right immediately another scene from Homeland. If you could put the next clip, please. So I think uh, you could definitely say this show deals with something that concerns a lot of people, or something that people talk about. Was that something that frightened Bert people when, when you suggested this show, or completely the other way around? No, you, you, you know, I, mean, I think it's what we all hope for, and there's a lot of luck involved in all of this, meaning that, you know, there was something that initially motivated it for Giddy, the, the germ of the idea, the POW situation in Israel, and then, you know, for us, it, it's such a hot-button topic that it gets a lot of attention. It just so conspired that the capture of Osama bin Laden was, you know, essentially as we were in mid-production for the first season and just threw a lot of light and attention and made people think about what all this was and what all it meant and what it was like to be a terrorist and chase a terrorist and think about a terrorist and what it means for how we live today. And, you know, it's a large part of, of what we all hope for here. But to be honest, when, certainly speak for Fox, when we are looking at the shows that we, are the shows that frankly are most important to us, they tend to be about important things in the, in the hour area. And, you know, for, uh, you know, I work in cable. So uh, cable in the U.S., if it's not controversial, I'm infinitely less interested. I mean, I'm looking for things that people are going to talk about and are going to be in the zeitgeist and are going to be in the news, frankly. Yeah, I'm not talking controversial. I mean, uh, let's, let's take the Emmys for interest. Um, the series competing with Homeland were a series really about dragons, to... series about advertising in the 50s, series about uh, England in, uh, in the beginning of the century. Homeland is completely different. It is. I can barely make out what you're saying because of the amplification. I need you to come a little bit closer. I, I would love to do that. Yeah. Can, can, we get, can we get another chair here? Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> That's what okay, you can like. you get me now? I just want to be closer to you. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so they'll get a chair in a minute. I can actually hear you now. Okay. Um, me too. What I'm saying is, as, is the series competing against Homeland during the Emmys. One of them was about dragons and kingdoms. The other one was about advertising in the 50s. The third one was about England in the beginning of the century. They were controversial, but they were not dealing with something that's happening or bothering people right now. And I, I would say they're, they're, you know, I don't know that I even think they're controversial. I mean, certainly, I'm fans of all of them, big fans of all of them. Game of Thrones is about, you know, uh, escapism and about, I think the audience comes to that to be taken away, done brilliantly. I think that Mad Men, which, which may be as good of a series as has ever been done in television, Giddy and I were just talking about it, I think um, is, is, all, is controversial in a different way because you're more further removed. It's a different time period. It's, uh, people don't dress like that anymore. I think when something is as immediate as what's going on between the Middle East and the U.S. and with terrorism and, frankly, even in the, in the case of Carrie, mental illness, I think it's all so topical and so much a part of what our sort of daily lives are about at this point, that it's, it just catches fire. You know, the removal of, of all of those shows from present day sort of reality, to me, makes them infinitely less controversial. There's also, um, okay. there's something about the zeitgeist, and, and, and you, you brought up Carrie's mental illness, and I'm allowing myself to say that 
was a brilliant thing because it didn't come from me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's something about this post 9 11 era and, and post bin Laden and post two wars where the American population thinks the government lied to them. And then suddenly you're seeing a TV show with a lead character that you don't know if you can trust or not. And I think that's very, very um, interesting um, for the audience. And in, in Prisoners of War, the, the definitely it tapped into the zeitgeist of surrounding. Um, so that, that's my next question. In, yeah. in, in Prisoners of War, you're doing a very good job, Giddy. So my, my next question is, I can't look. The, the Prisoners of War uh, dealt with, with an even touchier and an even riskier subject in Israel, and that's the, the subject of POWs. When you were making the show, there was an Israeli POW in captivity. Um, so tell us a bit about how you approach that subject, about the, the remarks and, 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 and how people reacted to that subject. Well, when I started writing the show, there were three prisoners of war um, sure. in captivity. Two of them later came back in body bags, and, and Gilad Shalit came back on the last day of shooting season two of Prisoners of War. Um, and there, there's something so raw and sensitive about this subject in Israel that it, it, I was shocked that nobody ever dealt with this um, as a drama on prime time or in a movie um, before. There, there's some articles about it, there's some, you know, PhD seminar works about it. But documentaries, never, maybe. Yeah, documentaries. But they all dealt with captivity itself, with the trauma. Nobody dealt with what happens with these people from the day they come back and on. And, and I discovered that for many of them, um, the journey, the hard journey begins on the first day when they're back home. And for some of them, it's harder than captivity itself. And that was fascinating to me. And I met there are about 1,500 former prisoners of war who live in Israel. Most of them um, were very known names when they were captive. And the minute they're back, they become anonymous. And I wanted to know why. And I. I met with them and I met with their families and their, and their children and their, their siblings, their community, the people who interrogated them. This would be very weird, because, but anyway. Now I'm taller than you. I keep thinking we, we <laughs> probably look like a penis, but anyway. Um, I talked to all the people around them and discovered that um, they all suffer from this post-traumatic stress disorder that we do not deal with as a society, we do not talk about. And part of not talking about it is also why they not, they're not getting better. They're not talking about it. Um, and that was, that was a big thing in, in um, Prisoners of War. And when people started hearing, to answer the second half of your question, when people started hearing that we're doing a show about Prisoners of War, um, we got some flack about how dare we touch a subject so sensitive, definitely when they're Prisoners of War in captivity, um, we're making money off the misery of people. Um, weird, weird arguments that I thought were um, absurd. I mean, th this is such a huge trauma in Israel, and we have to deal with it. I must tell a story uh, that happened to us at Keshet about two days before we screened the first promo for, for Khatufim, for, for season number one, which in the first promo said out loud, they're coming back on this and this date. And half... Awesome. Half of the cash management raised their hand and said, we cannot air this promo. This is, this is too bold. People will get mixed up. You're dealing with something that's too hot to handle. And people did get mixed up. Yeah. People, um, well, they didn't get mixed up in the sense that they thought the actors were yeah. returned prisoners of war. But our actors in the, in the beginning, when, when the show started airing, our actors could not walk in the street without somebody hugging them. For coming back home. Yeah. It, it's pretty amazing. And, one of, you know, one of our actors who plays um, Nimrod, um, he, was, he was driving out of a, a parking structure and the attendant there said, you have to lift your shirt, I wanna make sure you don't have scars. <laughs> um, so th the audience took this very personally, um, the show. And then you almost finish, you finish filming Khatafim uh, season number two, and then you get, a, you get a call from somebody you're not expecting to get a call from. Right. And who's on the line? Gilad Shalit who's, um, for those who don't know, is a prisoner of war who was with Hamas for five years. Um, and he called and said um, that he's a fan of both shows. 
and um, we, we set up a time for us and we met a few times. And then when Homeland shot in Israel, um, we invited him to come visit the set and he did. Um, and he enjoyed it very much. So, uh, turning to Bert, uh, both shows have POWs returning home, but both of them deal with it differently. Could you, could you explain a, a bit about the differences? Giri went through the process too, just about the difference of dealing with the main, what was the main subject in, in Khatufim, I think, but not the main subject in... Uh, and it's, you know, I just keep coming back to that theme about this sort of global collective of how I think television is going to develop. You know, that it, that it sort of takes a world to do it. And, you know, what inspired Galid Shalit and what inspired Gideon as a sort of cause celeb, although it was much more serious than that in Israel, um, you know, and a very uh, uh, great issue to the nation becomes, you know, uh, headed to the U.S. as a piece of entertainment, you know. And I think that the, the you know, the, uh, the goals become somewhat different. You know, Giddy starts from an emotional place, motivated by something he's living. Howard Gordon and Alex Gonza, you know, uh, both very involved, uh, very interested, I should say, in Israeli politics and in geopolitics, who had followed the, the situation there, and really were interested in this as much for its political ramifications as they were for its, for its uh, entertainment value, really, you know, said, how do we make this a show that an American audience is going to watch, not knowing who Galid Shalit is, not knowing what goes on in Israel. And, and you know, the, those changes are endemic to those writers, going back to storytellers. It's, you know, Howard and, and Alex shared a, a, a life on 24. Uh, they're comfortable in the thriller area. Um, despite the fact that, that Giddy's roadmap very much is a thriller, you know, I, I think some people see Homeland as mostly a thriller. You know, uh, uh, we're not, uh, U.S. isn't uh, enmeshed in it, despite the fact that there are prisoners of war. Are, you know, it's not a current topic. Uh, terrorism is, so they focus more on an Abu Nazir character. You know, the mystery of that. And again, it, it's, there would, what's so phenomenal, and I think what we're gonna see happening over and over, the U.S. and elsewhere is, you know, the, the, the world is getting smaller. We all know that. And, and to be honest, I think if you look at it, the leap from Hatu Fim to Homeland really was not that great. It was, you know, it, was, it all makes sense. Uh, the transition makes sense. You know, why Giddy created it that way and why Howard and Alex did it a little, turned it a little bit, all makes sense. And, and my, my strong sense is that uh, Hatu Fim is more popular than Homeland ever could be in Israel. And that, that Homeland is more popular than Hatufim would be in the United States. And that's how it should be on some level. I, yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. Um, so we have one line, which we call zeitgeist, we call, which we call dealing with the subject. And, and you transformed to the second line, which is, which is very much a big, thick line in Homeland and Hatufim. That's a thriller. Let's look at the second clip that shows uh, a turning point, I think, in, in both series. Let's take a look at that. It's a pity we have to stop it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's the end of the episode anyway. <laughs> so we, we, see, we see the same element used in, in both shows. Where's the idea from, Giddy, by the way? The idea came from, uh, actually from real life. Um, prisoners of war tend to create some kind of method of communication between themselves. Um, usually they're in solitude or thrown in some dungeon somewhere. And, and I read um, a book and talked to people who would hide notes behind loose bricks in, in, um, in bathroom stalls or use Morse code to communicate with each other. And I wanted these two people who come back in the Israeli version to share a secret and um, for the investigator to realize that actually um, they are talking this whole time that they think they're silent. And for Brody, this he comes back a war hero and Carrie is so positive that there's more to it and nobody sees it and, and that secret language immediately taps into our thriller sensibility and there's something more to it. So, so I think it's, it's a major part of, of the thriller that is Homeland is that even uh, the purest and most lovable characters in the cast have a secret. So sometimes they are hiding something uh, it's no longer that good and evil 
uh, uh, division that we had in series is, is sometimes you hate this character so much, you hate you love him. Uh, so so let's, let's talk about that, about the different main characters in, in dramas as it happens in home worlds. Oh, <clears throat> again, I mean, it's, it's the differences between, I think, you know, uh, uh, Hatu Fame and Homeland. I think that, you know, for those cable shows that I think are really getting the most attention, whether it's Mad Men or Game of Thrones or Homeland or Sons of Anarchy, any of those shows, you know, we have gotten to a place where they're extremely serialized, where if you miss one episode, you really don't, uh, you know, you don't know what's going on. And I think that, that what, what the guys on Homeland have really concentrated on, again, the difference being a hot button issue in Israel and, and having to figure out how to make that accessible in the United States was really creating, you know, um, uh, frankly, more of a surfacey soap opera on Homeland, and I think that it had to do with the fact that you know there's an affair going on prior to the, the coming, that you know uh, the children have their own secrets, that um, you know Abu Nazir becomes a big character uh, uh, that you just want to tune in every episode to basically see killed, you know, and it's that's what these shows are, you know, we. There is a reason why I think television is on some level sort of overtaking the movie business right now, and it's because you get to live in the depth of these characters, and without this feeling like a shameless promotion, you know, Gideon's next show that he's doing with Howard Gordon and Craig Wright, uh, uh, two days after he won the Oscar, Ang Lee decided to direct. It's called Tyrant, and there's a reason why he, a man who can do anything in the world is making that choice. It's because we live with these characters, these controversial, screwed up, you know, characters in a, in a depth that has become what the best television does. And I think you're just going to see it going further and further and further. doesn't mean that plots aren't important, but it does mean that, you know, I think that we bring these people into our home, we live with them week in and week out, oftentimes we're watching them with other family members, and you know, it's pretty gripping. It's pretty gripping. And that means they could be awful and they could be killers or they could be someone you want to be your best friend. But as long as you have some visceral connection with them, you know, that's really what it's sort of all about. So what, what we're saying, Giddy, is that we're no longer going to see just the Mr. Good Guy anymore or Mr. Bad Guy anymore because analyzing Homeland. Because Abu Nazir is, is the worst guy. He kills 400 and something people at the end. But then you feel for him because his son is gone and you have something you feel for him. Brody's daughter, which is the cutest, cutest girl ever could be, and you feel for her because the father's coming back and then she's in a hit and run situation and she turns somebody in. So is it the end of, of Mr. Nice Guy and Mr. Bad Guy? I don't think it's the end. I think um, every now and then we need a YPKA motherfucker <laughs> to, to make sure who the, the good guys and the bad guys are. But I think moral ambiguity is definitely something that we all relate to. We, we don't, we no longer look at the bad, at the good guys and be like, that's me. We, we, we can relate to, to bigger dilemmas. And, and I think The Sopranos did that brilliantly in the sense that you love this character and he's a psychopath and, and you're fine with it for some reason. And that makes you ask questions about yourself. And it, it's but just more sophisticated. In The Sopranos, it was, it was one character. The rest were, some of them were okay. In Homeland, it's like every corner you turn, somebody is very ambiguous, very... Right, but you know, part of the... And, and that taps into the zeitgeist, too. Carrie does some awful things to Brody in order to investigate if he's a good, by, good, good guy or a bad guy. But until we know if he's a good guy or a bad guy, we don't know if she's doing bad things or good things. Even when we find out when, that Brody is um, a terrorist, it somehow doesn't make him into a bad guy. So that moral ambiguity thing is something that we've been dealing with, I think, in, in society, and that's why we're seeing it. By the way, it goes much, even much further, I think, in both Hot Two Fame and Homeland, in, in that you know, what, what you hope to do is really ask that ultimate question, which is, are they the bad guys? Like, is there some rationalization or some validation for why they're terrorists? Uh, you know, I, I'm not, nobody likes the methods, but can we get into their head and understand why these things happen? And I think if it really, again, Carrie and Brody are certainly the heart of Homeland, and I think people do watch for those too. That said, 
you know, I think people are, are interested in these questions now. It's such a complex, messed up world that, you know, it, 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 by the way, awesome for the creators. It just allows you a breath of going to places that I don't think 10 years ago, you know, we'd ever go. And you're right. It, it, frankly, it all goes back to the Sopranos. Okay, so Mandy Patinkin's a good guy. Wait and see. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Let's leave it open. Is he? Mandy, I think Mandy Patinkin is a good guy. So that's a different kind of question. But um, so, so let's, we have two lines. One of them is Zeitgeist. The other one is, is Thriller. And we understand that in Homeland and Khatufim, Thriller doesn't only mean the plot. It means the way the characters are going throughout the, the, the season. Yeah. And, and the third line, I think, is emotions. Uh, there's lots of emotions combined with the thriller on both series. We'll take a look at, at a scene from Khatufim. Uh, it's, and it's a different, it's a very special scene. Uh, it's, it's a scene about a support group. Can you tell us a bit about how you shot it and who were the characters in this, in this scene? Well, the two characters that are coming to, to the support group are the Israeli Brody and, and the Israeli Jessica, which is Talia and Nimrod. And, and she's taking her husband to a support group because he is um, hitting her at night. Um, he's got these horrible nightmares and he's hitting her without knowing it. And these are all em elements that we brought into Homeland and then shifted a bit, we can talk about that. But um, the people that you're gonna see in the support group, and I don't know how long the scene goes, but the people in the support group are all real former prisoners of war um, that wanted to take part in the, in the series. And, after we shot the scene, the crew and myself and um, the, the former POWs, we sat and talked for about two hours about um, their lives. And the, the crew had an amazing experience. The actors had an amazing experience. We, we shot some amazing documentary stuff. So all the stories that you're hearing are real stories. So let's watch the scene. Let's put the next clip, please. It's hard to come back, but so Khatufim has and Homeland soon will speak about that, has, has a whole emotional arc. Yeah, I do, think... Do, do you find people that love the thriller, people that love the emotion, people who love them both, or...? Well, I love them both. <laughs> that's the most important <laughs> thing. That's why I think I wrote it that way. But yes, definitely. I think one of the major differences between Khatufim and Homeland, and, and Bert said it before, is that um, Homeland, I think, is brilliant and, but it's more of a straight thriller. When you see Khatufim, the audience had to commit once a week to sit in front of the television and cry. Um, almost every episode deals with very, very um, sensitive subjects. We all go to the army in Israel, so whenever something happens to a soldier in Israel, it's as if it happened in your, in your, in your home. Um, homeland, the audience sits riveted in front of the screens, and they can't wait for next week or um, um, for the next download to see the next episode, um, but there's a different emotional um, commitment, I think, to the show. Um, but that's because it's such a sensitive issue in Israel. I think uh, I agree and don't agree with you. I think Homeland has a strong emotional part too. Oh, yeah. So, um, if we take, for instance, the end of season number two, and right after the, the most amazing scene where you have hundreds of body lying there in body bags. And then Carrie is driving uh, Brody. And, and the scene, if, if you don't know the connection between what happened before and what will happen next, is an emotional scene. Mm -hmm. you, you stay there and you say, but they're in love. They have to be together. Well, that's what it is. Again, it just goes back to characters. You know, we, we, you know it's, it's funny. Uh, Homeland, Claire Danes was the first actor hired on Homeland. And uh, actually, Mandy was. but. We sort of knew that, that it was about the Carrie character. And Showtime did some research in the last year where, you know, based on that relationship and the connection between those two characters and actors, it had morphed from a show that the audience tuned into because of Claire Danes and the Carrie character to a show about Carrie and Brody. And I think that, you know, that's the power of what these things are when we care about those characters. And, very emotional, and to be honest, you know, knowing what season three, which goes into production in a month, is, it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, about the resolution of that relationship on some level. And my guess is that the first number of episodes are, you know, going to be as emotional as any episodes ever of Homeland. Exciting. 
So let's, let's take a look at that scene, and then we'll discuss the future. So <laughs> we always had Baghdad. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll always have Abu Nazir. Yeah. So, so what's the future? What effect did Homeland and Khatufim had on writing, drama, television, adaptation, whatever your, your take is? How did it affect well, look, the way I mean, we're making television? I, I think it's hard to talk about Hatufim or Homeland just as Hatufim or Homeland. I think, look, they're both extraordinary shows and uh, a lot of different things are involved. Very talented group of people, a lot of luck, right place at the right time. Um, that said, there is something going on in television right now, specifically as far as I'm concerned in cable television right now, uh, probably around the world, but focused on a number of shows in the U.S. Um, where, you know, there's just no limits. I think that, that, that people that used to make movies of a certain ilk are now looking to do them in television. I think for, because of shows like Hot to Fame and Homeland and The Sopranos and Mad Men and Boardwalk Empire and all of these phenomenal group of shows that we have, Breaking Bad, you know, it set this bar up here. And in the same way that you used to have, you know, Steven Spielberg and Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese going against each other, now you have Gideon Raff and Howard Gordon and Ryan Murphy and Matt Weiner and it's that group and they've put the stake in television. And, you know, I don't know where it ends. Again, I know that, let me say it again, Ang Lee's directing Tyrant, you know, a, a man who could do whatever he wanted, wherever he wants. And, you know, I think that's basically going to become the norm. And I think that television's going to conform to those kind of shows. And do I think Homeland is a part of that? Yeah, I do. I think it's a big part, uh, you know, with a group of very smart creators and very good other shows. But it's real exciting, I'll tell you that. I mean, I think that the future is bold. I think that cable uh, programming in the US is going to affect network programming in everything from how many episodes they make to subject matter, the kind of actors they use, and, and what they're willing to do. So it's awesome. It's a great time to be doing this. Kitty? I also think that people, um, maybe because of the different platforms that are available now, People are getting used to watching television in a different way. So many people that love Homeland came to me and said that they binge viewed it, that they, you know, they didn't see it once a week. They got less and less patient for that once a week show. So I think everything is changing and, and, and we're taking um, part of that change and it's very exciting. I think one more change I'm experiencing from, from doing television in Israel is, is the possibility for somebody writing a story in Israel one day he's named Gideon Ruff, next day he's, he's named Ron Leshem or other names, and taking that story and having a great studio like Fox 21 and Bert and the great guys there and making this the biggest show on earth. I think for everyone who writes a line now, whether it's Israel or Scandinavia or Turkey or any other television hub, the, the, the possibility of having written a script and having Angley direct your script even if you wrote it and you're not in Hollywood is, is excellent. But I want to be careful and I know you're going to say the same thing, and, sure. that, and that is that the, the validity of Hatufim or any other show uh, uh, being made by a creator for the country he comes from and what he does is frankly, I'm an ex-writer, is, param, is paramount to any of it, meaning I love that, and I, I make a lot of formats, and it's a, you know, it's a gift to me, and there's no one that enjoys the globalization more than us in Hollywood, but... I want to be clear that it is about the writer having the idea and making it for who he wants to make it with. Not There's no end goal of trying to get to sure. Ang Lee or the U.S. And, and look, I mean, there's no bigger fan of Israeli television than me. But, uh, uh, you know, you gotta, it's all about good stories. I, complete, I think, and this is just to echo what you said, I think the, one of the, the, the reasons Hatufim is so universal is because it's so Israeli and sure. it's so local. And I think one of the wonderful things that happened to Khatufim, the Israeli original show, very much due to the success of Homeland, it, it, it um, caused a curiosity to see the original version. And now um, Khatufim, which was intended for an Israeli market, which is small, is shown in its original version with English subtitles in Spain and France Netflix. and at UK, the UK and Netflix and Australia and Norway. So really, is, the sky is the limit. That's right. Okay, so I think our time is up. Yes. Uh, the, the, the bomb has ticked. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for coming over. I uh, hope you have a good market. I want to thank, thank Bert and Giddy. Thank you very much. Good job.
Thank you very much. Thank you.